original database, I went through and I basically uh, did a cut and paste of all the question, possible questions on our chapter tonight that we you, that you could come across. So let's uh, we'll just go through some of them. And uh, okay, simple one. How many microfarads is one million picofarads? Picofarad is one millionth of a microfarad. So if we have a million, million of them, we'll actually have one microfarad. Anyway, that's yeah, just uh, math for you to calculate. And uh, again, it's like uh, we mentioned before, the reason I kind of give you that quick review in case there's any questions. An inductance of 10,000 microhenries can be stated as, what do you think? One kilo. One pico. The micro Henry, so actually the answer is 10. 10, mi yeah. 10 millihenries. Okay. <coughs> Here's why I made a point before. If two equal value inductors are connected in series, what is their total inductance? Oh, in series, inductors, oh, same as yeah. double. Double, right on. Which I said that little, that little trick. A few times they've given you a benefit, they've, they've just used uh, equal value components. So like I say, there's no math involved, just remember if there's if they're equal, then it's simply half in parallel or double in series. How do you stick capacitors to the other one? What's that? Where capacitors the other one? Capacitors to the opposite. Oh, right. You use the, the, you use the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the parallel rules for series and you use the series rules for parallel. Like I say, everything in capacitors are backwards. Do you have enough of those to hand them out, the, your question? I don't have it, but if you oh. want, I'll tell you what. Anybody has any questions at all, send me an email, just simply my call sign. <laughs> B3DPT at shaw.ca. I'm more than happy, I can send you the file. I've got them all on my computer at home. Send them to me. The, the, your book? If you look, and this is a sticker in your book? Yeah, the, the database. The and it gives you the database there as well that you can get to for the exam generator by categories and by the practice exam. Okay. And it gives you the categories uh, that the publisher has put as well. They, they give you uh, questions on each chapter that are from the, the uh, question bank. So you can also get that from Coex Publication. And Bruce on the website is also the, uh, I put a link to uh, the actual Industry Canada yeah. website, so everything's there, you can just click on it. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so rather than go through the question, but I, I just kind of went through last night and I just, uh, like I said, I just cut and pasted the, the question just to apply, to apply to this chapter. And uh, these are the actual questions from, from the database. And uh, next question, I brought this up before. <laughs> What determines a capacitive a capacitance of a capacitor? And uh, you hit the various things. Remember, I, me I mentioned, reviewed them. Mm -hmm. I'll just read you the answer rather than go through all of your. Mm -hmm. So the actual correct answer was the material between the plates, the area of plate, the number of plates, and the spacing between the plates. And you got to and. Read <coughs> the questions very carefully because they say it's like two equal value capacitors are connected in parallel. What is their capacitance? Remember, capacitors being difficult, different. So two in parallel, double. You got it. And it's simple. And again, it, it's wording. Like here. In other words, to replace a faulty 10 millihenry choke, you could use two of two of them in two mil, two sorry two 20 millihenry chokes in series, two five millihenry chokes in series, 
two 30 millihenry chokes in parallel or two 5 millihenry chokes in parallel. So all of those choices, the only way it works is if you take two in series, two fives in series, that'll give you 10, right? So that, that was the correct answer. So again, that's, it's a different way of asking to calculate it, but it's all, it's all in wording. And again, remember what I, what I told you before, it says that uh, three 15 microfarad capacitors are wired in series. So the total capacitance arrangement is so now three, remember what I said about them all being the same, the math is simple, right? So three all being the same, we're just going to divide it by three. So the answer is five. Just, just a little trick for you. And again, a play of words, it says, which series combinations of capacitors would be best to replace a faulty 10 mi microfarad capacitor? Two... So now we're talking about series, so it says two tens, two twenties, uh, 20, 20 of them, two microfarad capacitors, or 10, two microfarad capacitors. And actually in series, so the actual answer was two. So if you take two twenties, put them in series, you're going to get 10. And Again, it's all, I'm just trying, like I said, tonight I concentrated just on the topics that you kind of really need to know to pass the exam. A lot of the other information, it's good reference, like after you've passed your exams, I'm sure you all will, then everybody can sit back and kind of say, ah, don't have to worry about the pressure. And then pick up your book again now when you, you're thinking about some topic. Now you're going to dig in, you're going to do, you're going to do, use this as a reference book. And, uh, okay, I'm going to highlight that or not too. But anyway, how does a coil react to AC? It says, in our choices, as the amplitude of the AC increases, the reactance decreases. As the amplitude of the AC increases, the reactance de increases. Right? As the frequency of the applied the AC increases, the reactance increases. Or as the frequency of the AC increases, the reactance decreases. Well, first of all, we can take two of them out of it because amplitude or voltage has got nothing to do with it. It's all the reactance only to do with the frequency. So it's down. It's down to the two frequency questions. And if I have it not, but in a, in a reactor, everything's linear. I'm sorry, an inductor. I'm getting hit himself. In an inductor, everything's linear. So as the frequency increases, the reactance increases. Because remember, our formula was simply <coughs> two pi f l. So as our frequency increases, increases. Whereas capacitors, eh? I said the old capacitors, they like to be different. So what happens here in the capacitive reactants, as our frequency gets bigger, our denominator gets bigger, so now it's a smaller fraction, right? So as the denominator gets bigger, so now as the frequency increases in a capacitor, the actual reactance goes down. It's the opposite, like the, everything's opposite to an inductor. So likewise, so our answer to that question is, as the frequency increases, reactance increases for an adult. And the exact same question except how does a capacitor react to AC? Is like I said, for a capacitor, the voltage has got nothing to do with it, so the two amplitudes throw them out. So over us it's it's opposite. So as the frequency of the AC increases, the reactance decreases, the opposite. Of inductance. <coughs> and the same kind of questions, they just keep, you know, just reworded. Reactance of a capacitor increases as voltage increases? No. 
frequency decreases. That's the correct one. It's got nothing to do with voltage. And like I say, it's inverse, so as the frequency goes up, reactance goes down, or as the frequency goes down, the reactance goes up. And as you get as you get on into the further chapters, you can really see the benefits of these things. Using a capacitor a as a filter in a power supply, we use our uh, or resonant or tuned circuits for for filters. This uh, the building blocks. Basically, inductors and capacitors are really the only two real frequency dependent components, or actually their characteristics that change with the frequency. If no load is connected to the secondary winding of a transformer, what is the current in the primary winding called? Well, Transformer, we would have no losses. In other words, whatever command went out, we had nothing. But we actually have a few losses. It's not perfect. We actually have a bit of core loss because if you notice, in the transformer, it gets warm, right? So in other words, that's not perfect. So that some of, some of the energy going into the transform is being converted to heat. So in this case, so we may have a, even a little bit of resistance to the wiring, whatever. So actually, if you have no load on it, they refer to that that current, that little wee bit of current on the primary is typically is the magnetizing current. Actually, you are slightly mistaken. They actually do have some calculation questions in here. Oh, but not resident. Do you have resident frequency? Uh, I haven't seen them yet. I'm just going through this. But uh, they actually do actually calculate the uh, the uh, reactants. Like one question here is oh, okay. a choke coil. Now here's another. Thing. Okay, terms of inductors. We actually, inductors may be known, we also call them as coils, we also know them as choke coils or simply chokes, depending on our application. Because if, say in your car, when you someday when you get to put your radio on, or maybe you've noticed when you put the uh, stereo in, you actually sometimes if you have a bad alternator, you'll hear that high-pitched alternator whine as your engine speed changes. So what do you actually do is you put, a, you put an inductor called a choke coil, in series with your power leads. So what is it? So what is an inductor? It 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 uh, opposes any change. It just likes a nice steady DC. So it basically will let the DC through the inductor, and it chokes. It chokes the AC noise that's coming from your alternator. So we refer to that as a choke coil. Just one form of inductor. But you'll hear the words are interchangeable: coil, inductor, choke. Alright, uh, and typically here's, 
here's here's a question a choke coil or just that's interchangeable with the word inductor is uh, 24.25 micro henry's is used in a circuit at a frequency of 200 megahertz and its reactance is approximately and they give you four four values remember now remember I said when we use this formula Okay, so in this particular example, it, it was uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Simple function. Something that. Plots. All right. So in this case, there's 4.25 millihenries and 200 megahertz. Remember, so in order to use this formula, we have to we have to change those to the basic units. So we have to actually, whether you're comfortable, like I'm comfortable doing this, I could say this is 4.25 times n to the minus three, and this is if you're comfortable doing it that that you know I'm comfortable doing it that way. But if you're not, we have to say this is four point two five millihenries is point zero zero four two five henries, and two hundred <coughs> megahertz is <coughs> you and I. Now we can plug that into the formula. So it would be 6.28 times that times that. Okay, so just remember when you when you're asked to do that calculation, you have to put it all back to the base to the basic values, you know. So then you're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Yeah, there's a few, a few possible. Uh, let's repeat again. Uh, the capacity and actually the answer to this particular one was uh, five thousand three hundred and forty ohms. They rounded off, so I mean, if you worked it out to five hundred five thousand three hundred and thirty-nine or something or whatever, it just rounds it off. Anyway, they give you four choices. Likewise, the uh, power supply filter has a capacitor of 10 microfarads. What is the capacitive reactance of this capacitor to a frequency of 60, 60 hertz? Again, that you have to convert all to the basic units. The answer to that one turns out to be uh, 265 ohms. If you want to do some examples. I believe there's examples in the book. And they keep going back to the same thing. In general, the reactance of inductors increases with increasing AC frequency. Because applied voltage has nothing to do with the reactance. It's only the frequency component. Simple uh, transformer question. Transformer operates 6.3 volt 2 amp light bulb from a secondary winding. The power consumed by the prop the primary winding is approximately remember 
power in is power out. So 6.3 times 2 is going to be 12.6 uh, watts in or out. So in this case, they only give you the secondary current and voltage. So you say, you know the secondary power, primary power is going to be the same thing. That's the answer to that question. Uh, transformer has 240 volt primary that draws current of 250 milliamps from the supply. Assuming no losses, what current would be available from the 12 volt secondary? You know, again, you're applying your, uh, your turns ratio. So power in, power out. Strength of the magnetic field around a conductor in air is inversely proportional to the diameter of the conductor, directly proportional to the diameter of the conductor, directly proportional to the current in the conductor, or inversely proportional to the voltage on the conductor. Current. The main thing. The main. The main thing is the strength of the magnetic field is is the amount of current going through the inductor. Or the, in this case, the conductor is a very very simple simple form of an inductor. taught this uh, this chapter so bear with me talked about very very beginning in inductor when we pass a current through the inductor through the coil we generate a magnetic field but also if we were to take that coil of wire let's say this is just a simple horseshoe magnet for example so here are lines of force so actually we take that coil and move it through a magnetic field the reverse happens it's actually going to generate a voltage in the coil as we as we cut the lines of force. Basically, that's the that's the theory of what a, how a generator operates. We take a coil of wire and we move it through a magnetic field, and we generate a voltage in the coil. So, the reason I had one of the questions here comes up, it says, maximum induced voltage in a cur a coil occurs when current is going through its greatest rate of change. The current in the coil is of DC nature. The current is going through its least rate of change, or the mag magnetic field around the coil is not changing. Okay. Anyway, the answer is one. When the current's going through its greatest uh, rate of change. And likewise, when you're getting the maximum, if we're taking that coil and we're getting the maximum amount of uh, movement or cutting the most lines of force, that's where we're going to generate the highest voltage in it. Efficient transformer has a turns ratio of 1 to 5, 
The secondary current is 50 milliamps. So this is going to be a step up transform, right? We have a 5 to 1 ratio. So the current is going to step up by 5 times and the current is going to step down by 5 times. So going in reverse, the primary is going to be 5 to 1. So 5 times 50 is So what kind of fuse would you put in there? You have to put a fuse in the primary. Well, it's again, it's like one. So whatever the secondary, the maximum secondary is going to be, it's going to be five times. Because we're stepping up the voltage by five times, but our current is be one fifth. So it's going to, I'm sorry. Or, yeah, our secondary current is one fifth, or basically the primary current is five times. So if that was the max, what, what it was rated for, if that was the maximum output of that uh, thing, you would have to put a, a, a fuse quarter amp or a fuse on that side. A quarter amp on the, on the primary side. On the primary side. Yeah. You always, you, you always protect on, generally it's protect on the primary side, on the transformer. And we're just about there. Um, there's one for you. Resonance. Resonance is the condition that exists when number one, inductive reactants and capacitive reactants are equal. Inductive reactance is the only opposition in the circuit. The circuit contains no resistance, or resistance is equal to the reactance. That's right. The list of the state of resonance is when the capacitive reactance is equal to the inductive reactance, so they cancel each other out. And again, this one goes right down to one of the examples I had, and the reason I put that example is parallel tuned circuits offer. What's special about a parallel tuned or parallel resonance circuit? The, the, the words are more or less interchanged. A resonance circuit, tuned circuit, basically the same thing. So parallel tuned circuits offer low impedance at resonance, zero impedance at resonance, impedance equal to the resistance of the circuit, or very high impedance at resonance. Remember I said look, parallel, parallel resonance circuits? It's the highest, it's got the highest impedance, or highest react, highest impedance, sorry, at the resonance. And rewording the same thing, resonance is an electrical property used to describe an inductor, a set of parallel inductors, the results of tuning a, a very cap, or director. Uh, faster, or the frequency ca characteristics of a coil and a capacitor circuit. Which one sounds better? The last one. Yeah. It's all about it's all about wording. You have to, you know, they can ask the same question about four different ways, and all really is asking you the same thing. It just take your time and read what they're really asking you, and it'll all work out. Huh, okay. Here's a good one then. They, they like to throw things in just to... A tuned circuit is formed from two basic components. Resistors and transistors. Directors and reflectors. Diodes and transistors. Or inductors and capacitors. We were talking about today. Inductors. <laughs> the other stuff is just nonsense, right? When a parallel 
coil and capacitor combination is supplied with AC of different frequencies, there will be one frequency where the impedance will be highest. Remember we're talking about parallel, mm -hmm. parallel resonant circuit. So the, the so then we're looking for the highest impedance and that will be at at what? The resonant frequency, the impedance frequency, the inductor frequency, or the reactor frequency? Oh, you saying resonance, right? Again, and here, we're, they're asking you the same thing, just worded differently. In a parallel resonant circuit at resonance, the circuit has a low impedance, a low mutual inductance, a high mutual inductance, or high impedance. Resonant, high, resonant parallel res circuit. Parallel is always high impedance at resonance. And a secret, and likewise, the opposite, a series resonant circuit at resonant, the circuit has low impedance, high impedance, low mutual inductance, high mutual inductance. Well, those two terms still have nothing to do with it. So what do I say about a series circuit? Impedance is minimum, right? Low impedance for a series resonant circuit. Okay, just test our theory a little bit. A coil and an airspace capacitor arranged to form a resonant circuit. The resonant frequency will remain the same if we increase the plate area of the plates in the capacitor, replace the air dielectric or oil in the capacitor, wind more turns on the coil, or add a resistor to the circuit. Okay, so We'll take the first one. If we increase the area of the plates in the capacitor, we've changed the capacitance right now. Since we change the value of the capacitor for our formula, our resonant frequency is going to change, right? So, the question here is the resonant frequency will remain the same. If we, so, definitely that one's out. H, replace the air dielectric oil. Well, we've changed the characteristic of the capacitor again. So. Obviously, we've, we've changed the capacitance, we've changed the resonance value. So, in the, thing with, in the question was, what won't change the resonant frequency? And the third answer was, wind more turns on the coil. So what are we doing there? We're changing the inductance by, by modifying the coil. We're adding some turns, we're going to change the value of inductance. So now, by our formula, a resonant frequency changes because it's a function of the inductance and capacitance. So the fourth choice, add a resistor to the circuit. Well, a resistor is not frequency sensitive, so it has no effect on the resonant frequency of the circuit. So that's basically the only thing you could do to that circuit that wouldn't change the resonant frequency, because you're not touching either the frequency dependent components, the capacitor or the inductor. So that's your only choice, and that's the, the right answer for that question. Now this, you'll get into this more in future, but I think I just briefly touch on it. Resonant circuits in a receiver are used to filter direct current, select signal frequencies, increase power, or adjust voltage levels. Well, the last two I really have nothing to do with it. So what did I talk about? The, the advantage of, of a tuned circuit is they're for a very specific frequency. So. Basically, we're going to use we're going to use a resonant circuit or a tuned circuit. They're interchangeable to select a frequency. So that's our correct <coughs> answer. Resonant circuits used to select a signal frequency. And again, and that you're going to, that is very almost every part of your radio is going to have some sort of tuned circuits. Capacitance exactly. So they're really the building blocks of the radio. So if you understand those two components, you're well on the way to doing a lot of things. And uh, again, just re rehashing the same thing. Resonance is the condition that exists when inductive reactants and capacitive reactants are equal and opposite in sign. Again, inductive reactance is the only opposition in the circuit. 
The circuit contains no resistance. That has nothing to do with it. Resistance is equal to the reactance. No. So obviously, inductive reactance and capacitive reactance are equal. That's resonance. That's the answer to it. And the last question I have for you is, it says, when is, oh, did we get into this? Well, this one could lead you off a little bit, but anyway. When a series LCR, or duct, inductance, capacitive, and resistive circuit, is tuned to the frequency of resonance, the line current lags the applied voltage, the line current leads the applied voltage, the line current reaches maximum, or impedance is maximum. Okay, series resonant circuit with the very minimum impedance, right? So therefore, minimum impedance, maximum current, right? You have the, the least resistance to the flow, so you're gonna have the maximum current flow. And that's your answer. So, hopefully by going through this, I've given you the, the tone or what the type, those are the, t the questions that are on the exam. And that's basically the, the items, I think I've tried to highlight the items you really need to know. And the other stuff is reference material. So, does everybody have a good feel for what you need to know? Now, questions? Why is that good or bad? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, any, any questions? Any concerns? Okay. Um, we're going to do something uh, at the beginning, Dave, if, uh, if you remember. We're going to put you on the spot now. Because um, we, were, we were trying to figure out, um, we have uh, usually retired people come and take this course. And we have a lot of people taking this course now who are not retired are working. So, uh, Dave and I were discussing this one afternoon and we said, hmm, what is going on here? There is something going on which we are not aware of and which we need to be aware of, right? So that we can tailor these courses to the people that are coming, what their interests are. So what we're going to do, we're going to put you in the last 10 minutes we've got here, we're going to put you on the spot, we're going to ask you to give your name so everybody else can hear what your name is. I'm going to ask you, why are you interested in amateur radio? Tyson. It's Tyson Danareth, and uh, actually, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm in the right course. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us that! I'm, I'm but disappointed I, now! <laughs> but, I, but I'm good with it, and uh, I figured it's just uh, something for me to do. I don't mind uh, learning new stuff. Uh, my whole uh, thing is marine radio, okay. and I wanted to acquire a um, permit for using my VHF radio, and I'm not sure I'm in the right course, but I'm going to stick it out regardless. <laughs> well, let me tell you, there was a local person, right? They had marine radio, they were in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I think it's going to be on our website, I'm not sure. It's going to be on the website, so you can check it out. Local people, they went to the Atlantic Ocean with the boat, right? They had marine radio. It did not work. They got nothing. They had ham radio, and they got a, a, a station, right? And they had to break in, because these guys were having a good conversation. They had to put some effort into a breaking in, and it saved their lives. Okay, I have read that in uh, a forum that I was Well, the, yeah. the couple are actually from the Sioux, and they yeah. Took, yeah. took my course a few years ago. And yeah. The very reason, because they plan on taking their boat out on the ocean, and they wanted ham radio as a backup and it turned out to but that's my story. There you go. Well stick with it. <laughs> and you know you can always you can always call me anytime if there's any problems. Eh? But if anyone can point me in the right direction <laughs> well, after well, this course. Well generally I'll just let me just comment on that because we're giving you a little bit of theory background. As far as I know you take you take the course, all it is is rules and regulations how to turn on the radio and operate it. They're not going to teach you any anything technical, really. But hopefully this course, you learn, hey, a little bit about antennas and radio theory in general. Uh, some, some useful stuff that you won't get in the other. The other is just, here, here's all the rules and regulations. Pass the course, now you can turn on your radio and use it. 
That's yeah. what you're going to get out of it. Hopefully this will give you a little bit more. And you see, I go back to this example, you know, that Tony went through, uh, and I always like to bring it up. We, we gear ourselves a bit to emergency situations. You're in the boat and it's sinking, there's one example. Or there's a disaster situation, you got the radio and it will work, right? There's nothing wrong with the radio. But somebody brings in a 24 volt battery, this is Ohm's law of course. You need to know how to put that 24 volt battery to make that 12 volt radio work without blowing it out. See, that's critical. That's where. That's why you need to know Ohm's law and how you get it, make a resistor somehow and put it in the circuit. Anyway, Ken, yeah. anything you want to tell <laughs> us about yourself? Well, I don't know. I have a general uh, interest in electronics and science, um, although I'm not very good at any of them. I wouldn't <laughs> say that. You've got a radio already. Yeah, well, I was, uh, me and my buddies, we play Airsoft, and uh, they usually get like the cheap uh, Walmart radios. But a few of them got the, uh, I can't remember the, the other name, but they're like PAX, PAXR radios or something. They're very similar to this. Um, and I went and got the Bofang, and I was, I seen some YouTube videos of amateur radios using the Bofangs to make repeaters and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, I was always at Sonic Northern talking to Ken. Yes. And Ken was putting a bug in my ear, <laughs> and he got me the repeater channel, I was listening to that. Yeah. And, uh. Then I was thinking, oh, I can make a repeater for airsoft, and I was looking yeah, in, in yeah. on it, and uh, then I decided, well, the, the course gives you so much uh, material. Mm -hmm. It's all science. It's all how the world works. How everything from your your Wi-Fi to your cell phone, mm -hmm. your microwave oven, um, the stereo in your car. Uh, you were saying with uh, your big stereo yeah. speakers and the resistance on those. It, it's all it's all the same. So once you learn the basic theory, um, I think uh, I can apply it anywhere. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, keep plugging away, and uh, you'll be able to uh, to uh, use that on the amateur frequencies very shortly. Yeah. March the uh, the 29th, a big day. Jim, I understand. Uh, Ken says Ken at um, at uh, Sonic Northern says. This man keeps the light on, so you better respect him. <laughs> yeah, I keep that. I work for the hydro company. I don't know if I keep the lights on, but I help. I help do it. Uh, my main, well, probably the main reason is every time I go to see Ken for parts, he's always on me about. Uh, you know, on me for years about doing this. Okay. And on top of that, I like lights. I think it's pretty cool that you can actually grab a radio and talk across halfway across the world. So that's the other reason. And that's uh, I guess that's why I'm here. Very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Adrian. Adrian. <laughs> uh, my brother's uh, into it. He's currently studying for his advanced uh, qualifications for it. Uh, and I thought it sounded interesting. So, yeah. Your brother says you got ham radio in your blood. You're already <laughs> pat you're already planning out your B your B station. <laughs> he wants to, to build you antennas in the backyard. I hear this is <laughs> it's already happening even before you got the license. Great going for you. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, <coughs> yes, he saw. Uh, I guess for uh, what program meant, like a future job will be like in the bush out in the middle so like for firm of communication. Okay, very good. Yes? Uh, I'm Jack. Uh, yeah, I've been the same boat as him. Yeah, you're both uh, forestry yeah. students, as I recall. Uh, right? Fish and wildlife. Fish and wildlife. So, so this is going to come in handy where there's no cell phones. Amateur, the beauty of amateur radio is you don't need the superstructure and you don't need, uh, you, you don't have to, to suffer all the charges that the corporations are going to give you. You set up your station right and you can communicate. Sometimes it's not as good as a cell phone, but if the cell phones don't work or you're out of an area, what are you going to do? Amateur radio works. Okay, Jack. Um, my name is Paul. I, uh, oh, I blew it. That's okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, Ken was the one who introduced me, actually, and I just think that it'd be uh, an amazing thing to learn. Uh, it's the fundamentals of communication through, like, uh, basically, you know, before any of the, the infrastructure we have now, and 
I just think it'd be uh, it would be interesting and uh, great knowledge to learn to add to the to the repertoire, I suppose. Okay, yeah, it, it is, and it you know it's a good thing to put on the um, on the uh, on the resume. And I got to tell you that amateur radio uh, amateurs have invented all kinds of stuff. PSK thirty one, which is a digital mode. That was invented by amateurs. All kinds of things to to connect uh, computers to radios. That's all been done by amateurs. Computer programs that help us, you know, do what we want to in amateur radio. It's all been done by amateur radio operators. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. One of these days, we should put all this stuff together to show you what amateur radio operators have really done. And they have done that right from the beginning of amateur radio, you know, at the time of the Titanic. They were experimenting, making radios, etc. Anyway, let's go over here. I'm Luke, and uh, I got into this uh, with Jack, actually, a few months ago. We put CDs in our trucks, just the top of the world road trips. And uh, I didn't, one thing I had a problem with the CD was the range. Yes. I wouldn't be able to talk farther. So, you know, Jack lets us drive really fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's always up ahead, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I just want to be able to talk farther. And I'm also in the same program as him and Jesse. In the forestry, yeah. Yeah, so it'll come in the future. Yeah, I, b I believe it, it uh, really will. Polly. Mm -hmm. You, yes. Oh, uh, where do I start? I thought it sounded very interesting. I mean, I was in communications, retired, but I was up in the uh, gigahertz microwave oh. and radio and stuff like that. Oh. Yeah, and so this is just another form of communications. Yeah. They're tired of fooling around with the high power, now I want to use low power. Okay, well we have a fellow in the club, just to show you how di diverse radio amateur is, because <coughs> everybody will get their own niche in it. You know, some people want to go out in the bush, right, with uh, portable radio. I know we're getting close to the time, but we have... Um, Peter, who's going to teach you modulation, transmitters, and receivers, what he does for his hobby is he makes microwave transmitters and receivers, uh -huh. and somehow he uses a single sideband transmitter, converts it all to microwaves, and sends it across Lake Superior. Their whole aim is to see who can send the farthest signal uh -huh. across Lake Superior. So there's all kinds yeah. of stuff that's going on like this in amateur radio that people make their own little niche. My niche is Morse code, CW operation. I contact stations all over the world with, uh, with CW. Okay, we missed somebody back there. The forestry, yes. Yeah, that's true, there aren't any options. And and when the cell phone dies, then what, right? Yeah. yeah. We'll skip over Matt and we'll go to Mr. Wu. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Wood. <laughs> hey, my name's Mike Wood. Um, I have a general interest uh, in uh, all things nerdy, but uh, I've been doing a bit of flying with Matt, and uh, if I want to get my own equipment, then I need, uh, I need this. Okay, that's, that's something uh, that everybody mm -hmm. should know about. There's a first-person view where they could actually put a camera on the aircraft, model aircraft, could be a drone, could be anything, and then they fly it, but they're flying it as if they were the pilot, right, because they could see, and they got goggles, right, and they could see everything in the goggles with radio transmitters, and Matt and his brother Ian are masters in this area, and this is, this is just blows your mind away, so that could be something that you guys may want to do in the future. And Dwayne, we're running out of time, Dwayne, but give us a give us something about yourself and before we forget Christian. Related to this, right? Yeah, well like why ham radio? What's your interest in ham oh, radio? Just like, uh, I like the idea of comics. Good man. Right start. So. Okay. Okay, very good. And Christian? Uh, I'm Chris Nelson. I'm in uh, electrical engineering at some college first year. So I I'm basically taking a course for fun while I figure out what I want to do with my life. So uh, I was at Sonic North getting parts for my project and uh, he asked me if I knew about this. I didn't. Looked it up. Seen like it'd be good. Have a club to go to and talk to electronics and talk to see whatever projects people are doing. So 
so. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, any questions, any comments before we wrap it up? Just make one, uh, oh, one, yes. one comment before we go. The question always comes, well, why do we have to learn all this stuff? Well, the main reason is with, ha with the amateur radio, the government gives you a lot of privileges. Basically, all they say, here's some basic rules and regulations, here's some frequencies you can use, and go to it. You actually have the capability, you, you're allowed to use enough power that could really cause interference to people. You can talk internationally. So that's why they're saying you've got to have a basic understanding of what you're doing when you turn on your radio and you're transmitting. That's why we have to go through all the stuff so you have a basic idea of what's going on inside that radio. But I'll tell you guys, I've only been at it, what, 15 years or so since I've had my license? Talk about a rush. The first time you string a wire antenna, like I did, between my two maple trees in my yard, hooked up a radio, talked, and somebody from Europe came back and talked to you. With just a simple wire stretch between my two maple trees. That's a rush, let me tell you. And your day is coming. Yes, Ken. Oh, I, just, I just wanted to comment. Like, uh, like I said, I'm in it for general knowledge, and while well, they say knowledge is power, and like how you were saying your radio said, oh, good for 25 kilometers, but these guys would say, no, any radio is good as long as you go line of sight. That's right. There's nothing in the way, but a one watt radio would get you anywhere, as long as you can see it. But another thing, if you know what you're doing, if you know the electronics, there's World War II stories of guys in. Uh, Japanese encampments and they used a couple nails and a piece of wire and they made a radio and they could hear how the war was going on and then they got like a hundred lashes after but that's another story. I'll just say one thing to all you guys, I was the same as a lot of people, I got out, I was in CV, I didn't, couldn't talk for it. So a bunch of people just like Bruce and Dave got me into it and that's what I did. I got into ham radio since 1990 yeah. and I gotta tell you one thing, when you make your first contact out of this world, that's where it's interesting. If anybody's familiar with the Mir space station back in the day that crashed onto Earth, I made a contact with just a handheld like this and a J-pole and talked to the Mountain Space Station. And you can do that right now. You can actually talk to the space station with your handheld with a uh, directional antenna. Mm -hmm. I've done it with my truck, but it's a little harder because of the Doppler effect. But you can do so much, and if you have enough power, mm -hmm. you can do moon bounce. Uh, and talk to amateurs uh, by bouncing your signal off the moon. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. There's so much stuff so. you can do. And and you're absolutely right, Ken. That that little radio in your hand, that $30 radio, remember this is the information age, right? Information is what is important now. A guy with a radio who could spot something, right? There's a problem, a transformer is blowing up, You've got a radio, you could call somebody, you could get that information to the right people, you can solve a problem. So radio is very, very handy. It, radio actually does save lives. It really does. Okay, we better wrap it up. We're over time here. Thank you very much hey, for coming. For Don't forget to give me your name tag back. Put it back in the box.